Good morning. It's great to be back at CA World, and thank you, Ayman. It's astonishing to think about how much the world has changed since I was on the stage a year ago. Pokemon Go brought us augmented reality at scale. We've gone from signing into our phones with fingerprints to signing in with 3D maps of our faces. The topic of artificial intelligence has gone mainstream. And we've seen social media used in ways that were never intended. Technological change has a way of sneaking up on us. 20 years ago, if I asked you if you'd own an electric car someday, I bet most of you would have said, no, they're just not realistic. 10 years ago, you would have cautiously said, maybe. But I bet if I asked you today, you would either say that your next car could be electric, or in fact, you already own one. That's disruption. It's when something that you never really believed would happen actually unfolds in front of your eyes. Tony Seba, the Stanford futurist, predicts that by 2030, 95% of people won't even own a private car, and that electric vehicles will devastate the global oil industry. Tesla isn't about putting computers into cars. It's about turning cars into computers. Cars used to be about manufacturing know-how. Now, they're about machine intelligence. The car of the future is an internet-connected mobile device full of IoT sensors and supercomputers. But it isn't just an object serving a purpose. It's a system that learns and improves itself, not alone, but as a collective with all the other intelligent cars out there. That sounds a little spooky. So that's cars. Now, let's talk about technology in the enterprise. I'm going to make a prediction of my own. I believe that by 2030, what we've come to know as IT today will be gone, or will be virtually unrecognizable. Last year, I wrote a book about how software has evolved from being a simple productivity tool to being a powerful feedback loop for customer engagement. Today, your software is your brand, and your survival depends on learning how to build and deliver software well. In my book, I introduced the concept of the modern software factory, which you heard Mike and Iman talk about and which we'll explore further a little later. Today, enterprise IT is struggling to recast itself to match the speed of technological change. On one hand, technology-driven change is accelerating like a rocket. But on the other hand, we have slow-changing organizations, cultures, and belief systems that are sometimes hundreds of years old. The tension between technology and human systems has been evident for some time. But now, it's showing signs of serious strain. The center of gravity and decision-making is shifting away from top-down bureaucracy. Today, it's about broad-based, fast-paced, user-driven experimentation and innovation, otherwise known as bottoms-up adoption. Technology itself isn't just a bunch of tools to help get things done. It's an emerging ecosystem of people and machines whose combined power and significance grow daily. We are witnessing network effects around us every day, and its exponential growth is beyond anything we ever imagined. In the midst of all this, how can you possibly make decisions around what will happen in the next year or three years, let alone five or 10 years into the future? With that as the backdrop for the modern enterprise, let's talk about how the modern CTO shapes technology to optimize growth today and in the future. Essentially, there are three things I think about. First, I look at today's environment and then I look backwards. 
Yes, backwards. The slope or rate of change of any vector can only be determined if you have at least two points. Better yet, if you have multiple points, you can estimate acceleration. The fact remains that the past is still often the future's best predictor. Take containers. Over the past two years, we've seen a very steep adoption curve. That helps me predict where containers and microservice-based architectures are headed two years from now. I'll give you an example of how we're planning for the future of containers a little later on. Second, like any responsible scientist, I must account for uncertainty in my model. When I project the curve of change out into the future, it's really just an informed guess about what I believe will happen. Now, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that the future is not completely knowable. You simply can't measure all the variables. If we go back to Jobs and Wozniak in their garage, the future was not knowable to the IT guy running a System 360. Yet the work in that garage would change that IT guy's world forever. Also unknowable was the future impact of Chuck Peddle's efforts to make a cheaper CPU. Yet it laid the foundation for the personal computer. When I started talking to a few friends at work back in 1999, I had no idea that we'd be responsible for starting a multi-billion dollar business that would change the course of interactive entertainment. But like Apple's garage in California, we changed the future with the Xbox. The history of technology is full of change vectors. But one thing we know for certain is that when they converge, interesting things start to happen. Next, once I get a read on where technology is likely to go in the future, I then start building for that future today. This is where a lot of companies get into trouble. They either take a leap of faith and tackle something that nobody even needs yet, or they build something for today that becomes almost immediately obsolete, or simply an attempt to catch up to the competition. At CA, we have our incubation engine, the CA Accelerator, to help us bridge between today and what's ahead. The Accelerator is grounded in customer need and has checks and balance to balances to validate what we're building. We use real-world adoption as an indication of demand. The Accelerator bypasses the paralysis that often happens in traditional technology shops. The new world won't wait for a complete set of requirements to start a long waterfall execution process. Today, you need to start with what you believe about the future and then iterate with your customers to continuously shape and reshape what you deliver. I mentioned the accelerating adoption of containers earlier. Now, let's look at a specific example of how we're planning for the future by building for tomorrow. As a tool for monitoring orchestrated container applications. So as we're moving architecturally from microservices, we need a way to be able to, to monitor these modern applications. It's so essential for developers these days and operators today to really understand what their systems are doing. We call this a culture of observability. So what we are trying to do is to get metrics from your container infrastructure and essentially run that through machine learning models and then decide whether or not these anomalies that come up are important for you to act on. What we're doing here at Fresh Tracks is building tools for those operation engineers and developers to help give them time back so they can focus on what matters. We're building this product from, from scratch so we can draw on, on techniques from this huge variety of domains 
mathematical neuroscience and, and uh, cognitive psychology ideas. It's one of the most frustrating things when I know better decisions could be made either by a machine or just providing data to an engineer and they don't have access to that. And so solving that problem, that's the thing that keeps me coming to work every day. Well, open source is huge for us because we're building on top of Kubernetes and Prometheus and it's very important for us to also give something back to the community. I think the Accelerator is a really great place to grow innovation here at CA Technologies. We're given a lot of freedom to go out there and find our audience and find the problems that they're having and actually build solutions for them. We have access to marketing material, uh, product marketing, the Distinguished Engineer and our, and our Angel Board to help influence our company and help us get our job done. As you know, CA has a strong history in monitoring, and our products reflect that. But we also recognize that new technologies will change the landscape, and we want to make sure we're building for the future in partnership with you. And you need to do the same thing with your customers. Start with what you know and what you believe will happen, and iterate quickly. Making this fundamental change is hard for everybody but we can make it easier for ourselves. We need to accept that the accelerating pace of technological change and slow-moving incremental responses have diverged beyond repair. We now have change vectors coming from every direction, mixing with and sometimes amplifying each other and confounding our legacy attempts at control. In the past, we got by, but today and in the future, we simply won't. What's your best defense? It's not any specific technology. Technology itself is ephemeral, and software itself is disposable. What you need is a new and different capability. The digital world moves fast. And instead of getting bigger, it's actually getting smaller. We're in the process of deconstructing our world into billions of tiny data points. Amazon wants me to think they know me as Otto Berkus, but in reality, they know me only as a data set. I am the sum of my past purchases run through their algorithms to predict what I'm likely to buy next. But despite all this data, it's actually getting harder for us as human beings to understand our world. We evolved to hunt, gather, and fight or flee from danger, not to find insights in vast data sets. So we keep stumbling across our evolutionary limitations. That's why algorithms and bots are so appealing. They can help us overcome our human limitations with data-driven, outcome-based intelligence. We're also struggling with ever-increasing customer expectations. In my book, I talk about how experience is critical. And as you well know, experiences aren't set in stone. They have to be alive and designed and built for ongoing change. And it's your software factory that helps you do that. You might think, well, of course we need a way to build software faster. But the modern software factory is about way more than just building software faster. Your software factory is the single most important enabler for your business. It's a way to sense, adapt, and respond to a rapidly changing world. And that gives you the capability to meet your customers' ever-changing needs on a real-time, live basis. It's time for stale old linear roadmaps to nowhere to move over. The modern software factory is the technology roadmap of the future. It's a dynamic, adaptable system that gets smarter over time. Not only that, but this new system is powered from the outside by your customers and from the inside by your people. Earlier today, you heard about the core principles of the software factory and how CA can help you on this journey. Now, let's talk about where those principles are taking us in the future. To be more concrete, let's pick a specific year, 2025, 
and look at a few predictions. Given predictions like these, is it really that hard to imagine sitting in your driverless car, browsing the aisles of a virtual store while you coast down the highway? There's no question that our future world will be far different in a few short years than the one we're living in today. Now, let's go through each software factory principle and look ahead at what's coming at us. First, agility. And note that I said agility, not agile. It's been over 15 years since the Agile Manifesto appeared on the scene. The Agile movement will continue to expand, but data and analytics will revolutionize Agile as we know it. In the future, Agile without data analytics will be like fuel injection without oxygen. And here's why. As the dream of continuous delivery of customer-focused value becomes real, Agile's appetite for data-driven insights is going to increase. Without it, software development will be starved of critical inputs. And data scientists won't just throw insights over the transom to scrum teams. They will become integrated into a highly granular and fast-paced process for creating value. This new model will be driven by sophisticated, insight-generating engines tied into real-time business metrics. The health and vitality of your software experiences and investments will be measured and even predicted in ways never possible before. The second pillar, automation, is all about increasing the throughput, efficiency, and quality of your factory. This happens today through things like continuous testing and integration and business process automation. Automation will accelerate your development, but only if you standardize and integrate workflows smoothly across the DevOps process and tool chain. And analytics will find areas that are bottlenecks or weak spots. The future isn't about brute force manual automation. It's about intelligent automation that learns, adapts, and constantly self-optimizes the entire system. In fact, we recently brought Automic into the CA family because of our strong belief in the transformative power of intelligent automation. As you heard, Automic helps companies get an edge by automating their business processes. Now, if software is essentially going to run software development, how long before we have software that builds itself? Well, that's going to be a while. But intelligent automation should benefit from what I'll call the decodification of coding, meaning the emergence of no-code or low-code platforms. These will allow developers to glue together blocks of code to create something new without having to change the underlying code itself. In places like MIT and Google Brain, they're working on software that learns to learn. That's because self-writing software isn't enough. You will need it to evolve itself through learning. Now that will be truly revolutionary and will free us up to focus more on ideas and less on the details and the overhead of bringing those ideas to life. The third pillar is insights. We've been investing on that front, as you heard earlier, with our advanced analytics engine, Jarvis. That engine is a nucleus for machine learning and machine intelligence. Now, there's a lot of hype out there about AI, so let's talk about it. For starters, AI is not one specific thing. You don't do AI. It's essentially a set of algorithms expressed as code operating on data. It's the analysis of historical data that puts the learning in machine learning. Data for the first driverless cars came from people driving regular cars and then using that data to correlate real-world conditions with expected behaviors. Today, a machine learning agent can't decide what to do in situations it's never seen before. 
Let me restate that. It can make a choice if we allow it to, but would you really want your driverless car to all of a sudden start managing your 401k at a busy intersection? <laughs> I doubt it. We deliberately code learning algorithms to abdicate responsibility when there's not enough data to make a good decision. In a driver-assisted car, it would recognize the situation and ask the human to take over. Hopefully, the human is paying attention. AI and machine learning represent a fundamentally different approach to software development. Why? Because in the old model, we coded machines to achieve hardwired outcomes. With machine learning, we give them examples of outcomes so they can learn and reach conclusions on their own. It seems like a subtle difference, but it's a critical one. What will AI in the enterprise look like in the future? I believe that machine intelligence will finally deliver on the promise of big data and will increasingly find its way into everything. That includes CA's products, as we discover more and more ways to use the power of learning-based systems to help you build better and smarter software. The core activities of managing, governing, and securing your technology won't go away, but they will become more efficient, automated, and intelligent. In turn, this will help you spend more of your energy on what matters, creating new value to drive your business forward. Finally, the fourth pillar is security, which I like to think of as simply trust. It is the foundation of your brand and your relationship with your customers. At its core, this is about securing the entire value chain of your enterprise. Big stuff. What threats do I see in the future? Nick Bostrom has a theory called the orthogonality thesis, which means that AI can have any goals you give it, good or evil, and it will intelligently pursue those goals. Microsoft's AI chatbot turned bad is just one example. As AI gets more sophisticated, it will become an intelligent hacking actor and part of our security threat landscape. The challenge will be to use AI effectively to guard against its malicious use. As you can see in the latest version of our access management solution, AI can add tremendous value by understanding and learning from user behavior. Our credit card analytics offering has been using machine learning for years to reduce friction in transactions while detecting fraud with ever-increasing accuracy. The truth is, the basic things that are at risk in the enterprise today, data and business continuity, will still be at risk tomorrow. And as with automation, we must build truly intelligent security systems to guard against tomorrow's threats. So if we add all this together, what am I saying about the future I see ahead of us? It's clear that the real shift toward intelligent learning systems is only just beginning. We are transitioning from the digital enterprise to the intelligent enterprise. AI and automation can help us if we use them in the right ways. But let's be clear, it's not a choice. We are never going to have enough skilled people to do the work that needs to be done. According to research from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, by 2020, there will be a million more jobs available in computing than applicants who can fill them. AI and automation are going to be central to helping us do more with the skills that we have. The age of cognition is coming, and we need to be ready for it because it's going to change how we work and what we work on. Silo technology will go away. Self-writing code will help make that a reality. Technology will no longer be at the center of the enterprise. It will be distributed and found wherever value creation occurs. The efficiencies that we gained by going digital over the last two decades 
will now be harvested through the use of AI and machine learning. We must all get ready for this tidal wave of change. As Mike said yesterday, we must thoughtfully and purposefully break down the barriers to meaningful value creation. That means removing unproductive development practices and silos and automating every manual process that you can. It also means transforming yesterday's organizations and cultures to unleash the full potential of individual creativity. We need to understand and accept that the way we organize work in the future will be shared with our technology. That means elevating technology from tool to partner and keeping our eyes open through this evolution. At CA, we believe your best defense against disruption is to start building the future into everything you do today. Thank you. So next, uh, next we're going to do an experiment of sorts. You've heard a lot from Mike, Iman, and me about how we're accelerating innovation at CA. And you can't do that without the right talent. We have some of the best minds in enterprise technology right here inside our company. So we decided that we would invite some of our very own distinguished engineers to the stage to talk about where they think technology is headed. Just briefly, a distinguished engineer, or DE as we call them, is someone who has a unique combination of extensive techni technical expertise, the ability to look into the future, and business savvy. It takes a long time to reach that level, and you have to have accomplished a lot. Now, I do my share of panels, and often they can get bogged down by their own brain power. It seems like there's always someone who takes 10 minutes to answer a question that he or she could have answered in 30 seconds. So rather than settle into long-winded discussions and comfy chairs, we're going to do more of an Agile-style stand-up. We're calling it Think Fast. Now, let me introduce our DEs. Richard Filia is so distinguished, he attended not one, but several universities, finally graduating from the University of Florida with a BA in anthropology, followed by postgraduate work in computer science at Georgia State. I'm sure there's crazy logic in there somewhere. <laughs> he plays acoustic and electric guitar and electric bass, and he spends a lot of time trying to figure out why there are more cats than dogs on the internet. Please welcome Richard Filia. Hey, Anna. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Originally a developer, Deb Danielson has brought her inquiring mind to a range of senior engineering leadership roles with a particular focus on emerging and disruptive technologies. Deborah holds multiple patents and is also an SVP in our M&A group. Her first tech job was at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, where she crashed the network on her first day and miraculously was not fired. She is also a licensed pilot. Please welcome Deborah Danielson. Hey, Adam. Welcome, Deborah. Our next DE, Howard Abrams is also the SVP of our accelerator. He holds a PhD in computer science from the Naval Postgraduate School, as well as a BSc in aerospace engineering, doing things we probably wouldn't understand. Of course, with such an incredible academic pedigree, he immediately went into gaming as his first career. 
but I'm not going to judge. He also spent a summer as a grave digger and was once in a Bud Light commercial. Please welcome to the stage, Howard Abrams. Selfie? Hey. <laughs> he just had to do that. <laughs> Completing our distinguished lineup, Craig, Craig Vosberg also has a degree in aerospace engineering and was a flight controller for the space shuttle at NASA. He has 30 years of engineering and management experience spanning IT, telecommunications, healthcare, and aerospace. Craig considers himself the ultimate geek. When not at work, he's playing with his quadcopters, 3D printer, or ham radio gear. He's also an avid cyclist, backpacker, and backcountry skier. Please welcome Craig Vosberg. Thanks, Otto. Great, Craig. Job. Do it. So welcome to this experimental Agile panel. And we're all looking forward to hearing your thoughts about the future. Just to be clear, our DEs don't spend their time locked away in our labs. They spend as much time as they can with you, our customers, to understand your challenges and then bring those insights back into CA to help us build what you need. So here's how this will work. We're going to have four rounds of questions that each of you will answer. You'll each have 30 seconds to answer your questions, so you're going to have to think fast. And we'll track the time as we go to keep us on pace. Richard, we're going to start with you. Okay. What will enterprise architectures look like in 10 years? OK. Um, well, so if we start to roll forward from here, say, a couple of years, I don't think we'll see things change really radically. We'll just see uh, continued and accelerating adoption of the things we're already seeing, like the adoption of containers and microservices and perhaps serverless computing. But I think the best way to think about the next 10 years is to look back to the previous 10 years and look at what's changed to get us to this point. It was just over 10 years ago that Amazon Web Services was released to the public. And now entire businesses are being run on AWS. So I think if we roll forward from here, we'll see a point where many enterprises will no longer own their infrastructure at all. So you must have been listening to my keynote because you're using <laughs> the past to predict the future. But Maybe a little. Yeah. I think you're spot on. Craig, you saw the Fresh Tracks video earlier. What's the one difference that you would want everyone in the room to know about container-based systems? The one thing. Um, I think I'd go with ephemerality, right? As we've moved from um, you know, monoliths into macroservices and now we're moving to microservices, um, it's the fact that things come and go and it's expected, right? You know, many of us have been building applications and putting monitoring systems around them that when something goes down, we alert, right? And so it's you know, time to roll out of bed and go figure out what's going on. This new world order for us is it's expected. We're going to be scaling from three units up to 100 units and back down to three units. And so things like Kubernetes, things like Swarm and Compose are orchestrating that and it's just a part of the new world order that we're going to have to get ready with. Haha, <laughs> and I'm close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ding. Very nice. Very nice. And you said new world order, and it really is a different way of approaching software and infrastructure. You know, having blocks of code that come and go on the fly, it's a very different yeah, way different. of thinking yeah. about architecture. Deb, this one's for you. Okay. And we've talked about this in the past. What will be the biggest stumbling block to realizing the full potential of AI? Big uh -oh. question. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds. Good luck. Yeah, there, there's a dark side to AI, and we're going to be hearing a lot about this in the future. You know, the core issue here is that we're learning in our machine learning uh, systems to recognize patterns outside of historical data. And the problem is some of those patterns contain bias and bad behavior. And we're at risk of having that bad behavior and bias driven and magnified into our systems. We really are going to have to watch out for this and make sure that we don't allow our AI to be driven by our history and not by our values. Yeah, it's a great point. And, you know, I talked about... Absolutely. 
I talked about making sure that we keep our eyes open and that we as humans guide this technology in the right way. It's critical. Howard, you run our accelerator program, which has produced incubations like Fresh Tracks. What advice would you give to anyone in the audience today who wanted to start their own program to incubate new ideas? Well, I, I think you have to tailor whatever program you put together for your own company. I think that's what we've done, and I think it's worked well for us. Um, I think if we copied someone else, we would have ended up with a mess. Um, but uh, for specific advice, I think you have to start with customers. You have to listen to whether it's an internal customer or an external customer. You have to listen to what they're saying. You have to understand what problem they need solved. The worst thing you can do is build something that no one needs and just waste everyone's time and money. Um, and then uh, once you've done that, it's about measuring it at the right stage of whatever incubation it is and being open and honest with your data so that you can in inspect and adapt. Not as good as Craig, but... I'm and passionate and <laughs> fun. <laughs> passionate and fun, yes. We have a lot of fun in the accelerator. Yeah, and it's so easy to fall into the trap of building something just because you can. So what yep. you're saying really ring, you know, rings true. Focus on the customers, use data to guide the development journey and incubation journey. So. So far, so good. We covered a lot of ground in round one. We talked about architecture, containers, AI, and innovation process. Let's go for round two. So Howard, we're going to come back to you to <laughs> kick, off, kick off round two. <clears throat> so I'm sure everybody wants to know how you went from aerospace engineering to being a game developer. So when I was, but, you know what? Don't don't answer the question because <laughs> I don't think we have time for that explanation. <laughs> Um, so maybe you could tell us what's today's grand challenge in software development, and what do you think the grand challenge will be 20 years from now? Uh, uh, um, I don't know about grand challenge. I can tell you the challenges I'm seeing with the development teams we work with every day. Um, they're struggling to go faster. Um, they want to, you know, they don't want to deliver once a quarter or once every month. They want to deliver every five minutes. And how do they balance that and still test and make sure their software is secure and reliable, don't introduce a ton of bugs? And how do they balance all that and not build huge mountains of technical debt that they'll never climb? Um, yeah, and then 20 years from now, I want, I want my code away from Deborah's AI. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of hype. Thank you. Ooh, a lot of hype around AI, but there's no question that AI will have a huge impact yeah. on how we build and develop new, new ideas in the future. Okay, Deb, you wake up, it's the year 2030. What's your biggest security nightmare? That nothing has changed. <laughs> We're in a war right now, and it's an asymmetrical war. We have to cover every inch of the surface of our systems, and the black hats have to only find one yeah. vulnerability to get in to breach. This past year, more than half of Americans lost their personally identifiable information to a breach. This is not sustainable. We have to change the paradigm here. We have to push security in everything we do, and we have to rethink privacy and security. Thank you, Deborah. There's a, there's a reason why security is a pillar of the modern software factory. And as you say, it has to be baked into everything you do from beginning to end. And we have to continue to invest in security. Craig, mm -hmm. we're seeing the emergence of serverless computing. How significant do you think its impact is going to be over the next five years? Over the next five years. Um, OK. Um, for the next five years, for me, I see serverless computing as like sort of the logical extension of what we're already on, right? We've moved from macroservices to microservices. Now we're moving from microservices to a serverless environment. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I think what you're going to find is you know, you're going to end up with more and more of a PaaS layer that you're going to be able to depend on. But I think the interesting part that's going to come sort of as the downside to that is the increase in complexity. We've moved from having one thing to having tens of things to having hundreds of things. We're soon to move, soon to, move to having tens of thousands of things that we're having to manage. And so, you know, that's monitoring problems. That's just how do you put them together and know what's running where. Um, so I think we've got a variety of things that are coming. So it's going to be a really interesting time for us. Thank you. And what I'm hearing is that there's no free lunch here. The nope. complexity is just uh, shifting. Gonna have and we have to adapt to a, a, a different way of writing and deploying code you know, for serverless. Richard, what are your thoughts on quantum computing's potential to disrupt blockchain and encryption in general? Yeah, that's a great question, Otto. Um, 
I'll, I'll talk about two things. First, Bitcoin as an implementation of blockchain, probably the best known. I think um, quantum computing has the potential not only to disrupt Bitcoin, but actually to destroy it because of the vulnerability of public key cri cryptography to quantum computing. Um, that said, I think if we look at the broader blockchain ecosystem, I think it will be made stronger, faster, and cheaper because of quantum computing. There's already uh, a public project underway to create a so-called quantum-resistant ledger, for example. Um, there's also uh, a project that just come out that actually leverages quantum capabilities to do authentication in a way that's not possible without quantum computing. Thank you, Richard. A little over time, but it's a complex question, <laughs> so thank you. And <laughs> Tough topic. Yeah? Tough topic. You know, we've seen this play before. You know, some new disruptive technology comes along and we all think, oh, it's going to destroy everything that, that has come before. And that's not the case. We're going to evolve, adapt, and uh, incorporate this new technology into uh, the technology ecosystem. So this brings us to the end of round two. And I think, I think we're on a pretty good roll here. I think we've seen, gotten some good insights from you on uh, future challenges. Uh, and opportunities ahead. Um, we're going to move into round three, and we're going to mix it up a little bit and have a little bit of fun. So, Deb, we're going to kick it off with you. In addition to being a DE and being a patent holder, you're also a pilot. So if Elon Musk came to you and asked you to travel as a SpaceX test pilot, what would you say to him? Yes! Yeah. <laughs> to give, her, to thank me. give her the <laughs> easiest question. That was the oh, easiest man. question. <laughs> I think you guys are crazy, but um, there was no hesitation here, and it's clear that um, you and your fellow panelists have an appetite for risk, which you have to take to move into the future. Uh, we have a little bit of time. Maybe you could tell us as a pilot and potential test pilot what the difference is between a good landing and a great landing. Okay, yeah, that's an easy one, too. A good landing is anyone you walk away from and in a great landing, you can use the airplane again. <laughs> but I, nice. well, I'm hoping for a great landing for you. Uh, Howard, given your background, as a former game developer, what video game do you think best represents your life? <laughs> I think someone knows me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a product of 80 arcades, so, you know, I, Something from that era, probably not flaming barrels from Donkey Kong. Um, uh, too picky of an eater for Pac-Man. Maybe something like a, a Dragon's Lair, um, just trying to just figure out if you go left or right over and over and over again, quarter after quarter, um, until, you, until you figure it out and you get to the next challenge and you do it again and again. I would have guessed Joust. Joust, I love Joust. <laughs> You know, it's a, actually a somewhat insightful answer, I'm sure informed by your background as a software developer, because that sounds like the yeah. life of a software it's developer. pretty much every day. Craig, mm -hmm. what was the most interesting project you worked on at NASA? At least one that you can talk to us about. Okay. Um, HST, um, Hubble Space Telescope. Um, I came to NASA after what they called the brain drain, so it was after the Challenger accident and prior to return to flight. And um, they hired hundreds of us college grads, but when we were brought in, we were given software that was written in a combination of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, it was some assembly, it was some uh, HP basic of all things, and some Fortran. And so we had to rewrite all of that to be able to support the new mission characteristics that we had. And so we had to figure out, you know, how do you model the, the Hubble Space Telescope? How do you put it onto an arm? How do you put it in a position so you can do uh, calculations to be able to find things? Um, so it, it was a really interesting time to be there. And I was not a part of any of the hardware for the Hubble Space Telescope. So <laughs> that was a different issue that happened after me. So I was good. Just to clarify, you were not responsible for yeah, the hardware well, bug, a pretty big one. But, you know, you bring up a, a really good point, and government programs sometimes, you know, don't have a good reputation, but in this instance, this program, you know, injected a huge amount of talent into both government and industry. Absolutely. Richard, what will you name your first robot, and what do you <laughs> hope it's going to do for you? Um, yeah, okay. Um, you know, I think as humans, we have a tendency to anthropomorphize objects, as I, for a good anthropologist. As the anthropologist, right? yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we, look, look how much we love our cars. I think that there, there'd be a great temptation to treat a robot as a pet, 
So I'm not sure I would give it a personal name. I would just probably call it automation unit. And that way I could simply say, hey you, go fix my bills. Oh, put on pump. Yeah, nice try. <laughs> but on a more serious note, um, and we'll take a little bit of extra time here, sure. um, because there's such an intersection of so many things around ro uh, robotics. Um, when do you think you're going to be buying your first robot? Hopefully by the end of the month. When do you really think? Yeah, so seriously, it, it is an important question, a really interesting one. In fact, if you just go out and do a Google search on personal robot, there is a lot of activity. Sony and, and Honda attempted to in, enter the personal robot market in Japan a few years ago, and they hit a wall with AI. Now, because of the advances of AI, the rumor is that Sony is going to re-enter the personal robot market, and guess what? It's going to look like a pet dog. So much for my theory. <laughs> And again, another example where AI is really enabling an entirely yep. you know, yep. new market, in fact. It, it'll have a lot of you know, Alexa-like skills, so you can ask it for help. And I think you know, what we'll see is robots as companions as much as assistants. Final round. And this is just going to be one question that each of you is going to answer. And there's not going to be a timer on this one, because the question is so important. Although we're still keeping this fast and agile, so no 10-minute answer, <laughs> please. What is it going to take to ensure that businesses have the skills they need to realize the full potential in the years ahead? Howard, let's start with you. I think talent's a huge challenge in the years ahead. Um, I would start with diversity. I think um, you see diversity a lot in the news, especially the lack thereof when it comes to large technology companies. Um, but what I haven't seen, at least in the news yet, is a discussion of why diversity is important. Um, so if you were to try and solve one of your top technical or business challenges, you could stick some white middle-aged men with aerospace engineering degrees in a room, and <laughs> we would definitely find an answer. Um, not necessarily it, the right one. Not necessarily the right one. <laughs> not necessarily the best one, but we will find an answer quickly. What you really need to do is get people with diverse opinions in a room, with diverse um, education and skills in a room to brainstorm and figure out how to best solve the problem and be creative. Um, and if you're going to get diverse skills and interests and backgrounds, that ultimately means diverse people need to be in that room. So I, I think that's a key challenge. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And you know, the fact is that you know, diverse, diversity is a real business enabler. Yeah. It's not a fashion statement. It's how you get the best outcome. It's a requirement. It's a requirement. Craig, let's hear from you. You bet. Um, so multifaceted problem, right? So I think I'll take a slightly different angle at it. Um, for me, I'm an I'm engineer, right? Background is in STEM, um, so science, technology, engineering, math. It served me really well um, being at NASA. I couldn't have done many of the things that I did when I was there if I hadn't had that as my background. But what I see is the number of candidates, we're losing the funnel. We need to figure out how we open that funnel up, open the aperture up, and not lose so many of the kids when they're still in you know, elementary school and, and middle school. Um, you know, by the time they get to high school, they're already in a position where they can't play catch up to be able to get the necessary classes and stuff in. Um, I really think we've got to figure out how do we link this together? How do we make you know, the fact that you know how to do linear algebra means, wow, you can go on to do graphics work, right? And I don't think the, a bunch of that's being lost at the younger ages as we're going through this. And we got to do a better job of driving this down, I think. I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, it's, we need to think of it as a talent creation pipeline that needs to start early. We need yep. to get kids hooked yeah. way earlier Sooner. in the process yes. than yep. what we're doing today to make sure that they continue to be interested in STEM and pursue that. Absolutely. Thank you. Deborah? Yeah, so I think we need to really open up the aperture of the type of talent that we bring into technology-based businesses. I mean, first of all, every business is becoming a technology-based business. So this talent gap is only going to get bigger. It's not going to get smaller. And today, I think we over-rotate on you know, finding and developing STEM only as the solution. And I think we're, as we evolve, we're going to be bringing in more people who don't need to have that deep analytical coding technologist type capabilities because 
they're going to be focused on the no-code, low-code, on driving AI to solve business problems in ways that meet the needs of a vast spectrum of people out in the marketplace. You know, we want products and solutions and technologies that appeal to the dancer and the linguist, not just the engineer, and so we have to bring them in. Or the and anthropologist. We have to, and, the, and the anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> we have to make sure that we're really developing, nice. you know, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary problem solvers, you know, mm -hmm. for next generation challenges. We're going to close it out with you, Richard. Okay. Thank you, Otto. Um, thinking about this, I, I, I have a suggestion that I think accommodates what, what we've all been saying up here in some way, bringing in STEM earlier, for example, and how to find those multidisciplinary type people and get the diversity we need. First of all, for me, this is a really personal question, being the father of a daughter that just graduated with an environmental engineering degree last spring. And I see the passion that she has for genuinely trying to make the world a better place. She wants to contribute. She wants to have a voice and be an active participant, but I'm also seeing the, her struggle to get her foot in the door. So my suggestion is that we return to the classical values of a liberal arts education, bringing STEM in as part of that, as an integrated part of it, and focus on the three critical factors of, of that approach, which is l critical thinking ability, learning how to learn, and communication. Yeah. And communication, by the way, is not just being able to express your ideas, it's being able to listen, able and willing to listen, and then take what you've heard and translate that into how you're going to use technology to make the world a better place. Thank you, Richard. And it's yeah. so critical that we develop the right kind of creative, creative problem solvers, because the challenges today are complex and are going to get increasingly so. We also have to make sure that we provide, as both industry and government, we have to provide opportunities for the fresh talent that's, uh, that's, that's coming out of the, the end of the pipeline and make sure that we, we nurture that talent. Absolutely. The interesting thing about all of your answers, they're all different, but each one you know, is, is, and I'm nodding my head going, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Uh, and I think it's a good il illustration of the fact that this is a complex challenge. There isn't a silver bullet. There isn't a single, one single thing that, that we can do to address this challenge. It's going to take a multi-pronged approach to make sure that uh, we address it. So I want to thank all of the DEs, DEs here for being here today and sharing their incredible insights. Thank you. If you'd like to hear more from the DEs, I encourage you to visit the Accelerator Zone on the show floor and catch up with them there. As you heard, getting enough of the right talent is going to be difficult in the years ahead. In fact, the next tech challenge isn't about technology. It's about people. I'd like to close with a few thoughts on the skills challenge, which is so critically important to CA and everyone in this room. We know that automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are going to augment the skills we have today. But how do we get the most out of the human side of the equation tomorrow? How do we collectively amplify our humanity? How do we get the most out of us? At CA, we know the future depends on getting the best talent and that means the most diverse talent. That's why we've developed a series of films called the STEM 10 to promote awareness of this important issue. It features some of tomorrow's tech leaders and their call to action for all of us. These exceptional young people are passionate about doing things differently. And we need to nurture that passion to realize our collective potential. Let's listen to them. Where are the people in technology that look like me, that are creative like me, that want to change the world and fix things and build them back?
Inventing is something simple and human. It's just problem solving with a physical solution. The problems don't, don't have color. They, they don't have gender. They don't care. I want to show young girls out there that they can do it too. It's fun to be on the cutting edge. That's where your invention can come in. That's when your innovation can come in. Technology can facilitate any idea you have and any dream you have. I always wanted this story to be told. Technology is changing all of our worlds, from how it creates value in the enterprise to how we live our lives every day. I believe we are at a crossroads, and we have a choice. We can either fight that change, or we can lead it. If we're going to lead it, we need everyone at the table. None of us are ever going to be as strong as all of us. With our mission, to remove barriers at our core, CA is moving forward to what we believe is a bright and promising future, a place where we can all work together to create, inspire, and achieve tomorrow. That future belongs to all of us. I'd like to thank our DEs again and thank all of you for joining us here today. Enjoy the rest of CA World.